The Jacobite Risings were a series of uprisings, rebellions, and wars in Great Britain and Ireland occurring between 1688 and 1746. The uprisings had the aim of returning James VII of Scotland and II of England, the last Catholic British monarch, and later his descendants of the House of Stuart, to the throne of Great Britain after they had been deposed by Parliament during the Glorious Revolution. The series of conflicts takes its name from Jacobitism, from Jacobus, the Latin form of James. The major Jacobite risings were called the Jacobite Rebellions by the ruling governments. The First Jacobite Rebellion and Second Jacobite Rebellion were known respectively as the 15 and the 45. After the years in which they occurred, although each Jacobite rising had unique features, they were part of a larger series of military campaigns by Jacobites attempting to restore the Stuart kings to the thrones of Scotland and England. James was deposed in 1688 and the thrones were claimed by his daughter Mary II jointly with her husband, the Dutch-born William of Orange. After the House of Hanover succeeded to the British throne in 1714, the Risings continued and intensified. They continued until the last Jacobite rebellion, led by Charles Edward Stuart, who was soundly defeated at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. This ended any realistic hope of a Stuart restoration. Glorious Revolution During the 17th century, the kingdoms in Great Britain and Ireland suffered political and religious turmoil in the wars of the three kingdoms. The Commonwealth ended with the restoration of Charles II, re-establishment of the Church of England and imposition of Episcopalian church government. In 1685 Charles II was succeeded by his Roman Catholic brother, James II and VII. James was not naturally sympathetic to covenanters. He saw them as troublemakers and initially tried to end their influence in Scotland. The new king also tried to impose religious tolerance of Roman Catholics and to a lesser extent Protestant dissenters, but antagonized many of the Anglican establishment by this action as they were suspicious of Catholic power. James' half-hearted attempts to woo the Presbyterians seemingly did not win him much popularity among that section of society either. They remembered his earlier suppression of them and did not believe him to be sincere in his recognition of Presbyterianism. Although these actions were widely unpopular, at first the majority of his subjects tolerated these acts because James was in his fifties and both of his daughters were committed Protestants. It seemed that James' reign would be short and the throne would soon return to Protestant hands. In 1688 however James's young second wife Mary of Modena gave birth to a boy, Prince James who was promptly baptised a Roman Catholic. Due to English and Scottish succession laws, Prince James immediately supplanted his older half-sisters as heir to the throne. Now the prospect of a Catholic dynasty on the English, Scottish and Irish thrones seemed all but certain. The Immortal Seven invited James's daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange to depose James and jointly rule in his place. On 4 November 1688 William arrived at Torbay, England. After he landed, James fled London, returned and finally left for France on 23 December. In February 1689 the Glorious Revolution formally changed England's monarch, but many Catholics. Episcopalians and Tory royalists still supported James as the constitutionally legitimate monarch. Scotland was slow to accept William, who summoned a convention of the estates which met on 14 March 1689 in Edinburgh. It reviewed a conciliatory letter from William and a haughty one from James. On James's side, a modest force of a troop of 50 horsemen gathered by John Graham of Claver House, by Count Dundee was in town. Graham attended the convention at the start but withdrew four days later when its support for William became evident. The convention set out its terms, and William and Mary were proclaimed at Edinburgh on the 11th of April 1689, then had their coronation in London in May, crucially perhaps. 
William and Mary definitively accepted the Church of Scotland as a Presbyterian institution after decades of intermittent efforts by various monarchs, including James VI, Charles I, Charles II and James VII to mould the Church of Scotland into an Episcopalian institution more pliable to royal control and possibly more acceptable to those monarchs who happen to be Catholic. Therefore, the already doubtful potential popularity of Jacobitism among those of the Presbyterian persuasion in Scotland was quite possibly lessened by this act. But on the other hand, for those Scots of an Episcopalian or Catholic persuasion the appeal of Jacobitism could only have been enhanced by this acknowledgement of Presbyterianism in Scotland by William and Mary. The rising of 1689-92 On 16 April 1689 John Graham of Claver House, by Count Dundee, raised James' standard on the Dundee Law. Presbyterian historians later labelled him Louis de Clavers for his presence as an officer in the service of government forces loyal to the king at several altercations between government forces and covenanters during the reign of the Catholic James VII who was later deposed. One example is the Battle of Drumclog, while another is the Battle of Bothwell Brig. In letters written by the Viscount Dundee's own hand he was however an advocate of lenient treatment of the Covenanters. James VII also happens to be the origin of the epithet Jacobite. After James was exiled his followers were named after the Latin for James, Jacobus, and the name Jacobite was later used for those who sought to restore his dynasty even after his death, citing his descendants as the rightful monarchs. Thus, the appropriateness of the title, Louis de Clavers, being used to describe John Graham of Claver House aside, the Jacobite hero has clearly not always been viewed in a positive light by those sympathetic to the Covenanters or Cameronians. With respect to the Viscount Dundee, Sir Walter Scott coined the more romantic nickname of Bonnie Dundee. This was from a poem Sir Walter Scott wrote in 1830, which later became a well known song. James VII had already arrived in Ireland and a letter was on the way promising Irish troops to assist the rising in Scotland. At first Viscount Dundee had difficulty in raising many supporters. The ineffectiveness of the Williamite commander Major General Hugh Mackay of Scory encouraged support. 300 Irish troops successfully landed at Kintyre to add to Dundee's forces. Dundee also received support in the Western Scottish Highlands from both Roman Catholic and Church of Scotland clans. He also had some lowland support, which is often overlooked by historians. This included several peers of the realm, including James Seaton, 4th Earl of Dunfermline, who was a member of the Privy Council and who was Dundee's cavalry commander for most of the Rising. Other lowland peers and gentry who rode with Dundee included James Galloway, Lord Dunkeld, James Halliburton of Pitcur, Sir George Berkeley, Lord William Murray, Alexander Fraser, elder brother of Simon Fraser, later 11th Lord Lovett and Gilbert Ramsay, a prominent Edinburgh lawyer peers and members of noble families who joined the Jacobites after Dundee's death include Kenneth Mackenzie, 4th Earl of Seafith, Thomas Fraser, 10th Lord Lovett, and Lord James Murray. By July the Jacobites had eight battalions and two companies, almost all Highlanders. Dundee gained the confidence of the clans by cultivating the allegiance of each Highlander and respecting the precedence of the clans. He realized that to them, the cause of Jacobitism was secondary. At a time when infantry were trained to fight in formation, the Highlanders' method was more informal. They set aside their plaids and other encumbrances before the battle, and dropped to the ground to avoid enemy volleys. After quickly returning fire, they pursued their foes, screaming in the Highland charge. They used heavy broadswords and tush, or whatever weapons they had, including pitchforks or locker barraxes. Such a charge was devastating to troops struggling to reform their lines, or fix the recently introduced plug bayonets. 
The Highland Charge routed a much larger Williamite force at the Battle of Killiecrankie on 27 July 1689. About 2,000 Willamite troops were killed. Approximately 600 Highlanders were killed, plus a number of Jacobite Lowlanders, including Dundee himself, Pitker of Halliburton, and Gilbert Ramsay. At the street fighting of the Battle of Dunkeld on 21 August, the Jacobite Highlanders were decisively defeated by the Cameronians who were led by George Munro, first of Ock and Bowie. Much of the North remained hostile to the Williamite government. Expeditions to subdue the Highlands were met with a series of skirmishes. Jacobite forces suffered a heavy defeat at the Hawes of Cromdale on 1 May 1690. Later that month Mackay constructed Fort William on the site of an old fort built by Cromwell. News in July of William's victory over James at the Battle of the Boyne caused Jacobite hopes to fall. On 17 August 1691 William offered all Highland clans a pardon for their part in the Jacobite uprising, provided that they took an oath of allegiance before 1 January 1692 in front of a magistrate. The Highland chiefs sent word to James, now in exile in France, asking for his permission to take this oath. James eventually authorized the chiefs to take the oath but it was mid-December before his message arrived. Despite difficult winter conditions, a few took the oath in time. The brutality of the massacre of Glencoe sped acceptance by the clans. By the spring of 1692 the Jacobite chiefs had all sworn allegiance to King William. The Jacobite War in Ireland The Williamite War in Ireland was the opening conflict in James's attempts to regain the throne. It influenced the Jacobite rising in Scotland which Bonnie Dundee started at about the same time. By its end in October 1691, the Irish Jacobite army left Ireland for France, becoming the Irish Brigade. This later provided forces assisting the 45 in Scotland. The Old Pretender After the death of James II in 1701, the Jacobite claim to the thrones of Scotland and England was taken up by his only surviving legitimate son, James Francis Edward Stuart. His supporters proclaimed him James III of England and Ireland, and James VIII of Scotland. The French King Louis XIV and Pope Clement XI formally recognized the Catholic monarch as King James III and VIII. Later, James was called the Old Pretender, to distinguish him from his son, Charles Edward Stuart, who became known as the Young Pretender. Planned invasion of 1708 after a brief peace, the outbreak of the War of the Spanish Succession in 1701 renewed French support for the Jacobites. In 1708 James Stuart, the old pretender, sailed from Dunkirk with 6,000 French troops in nearly 30 ships of the French Navy. His intended landing in the Firth of Forth was thwarted by the Royal Navy, under Admiral Bing. Over the tearful protests of James himself, the French Admiral chose not to risk a landing and opted to retreat instead of fight. The French fleet, pursued by the British round the north of Scotland, lost ships and most of their men in shipwrecks on the way back to Dunkirk. A number of Jacobite lairds gathered at Brigo, Turk in support of the invasion. They were arrested and imprisoned in Newgate, and subsequently transferred to Edinburgh Castle and tried for high treason. They were acquitted of this charge, as the evidence against them only proved that they had drunk James' health. The rising of 1715 following the arrival from Hanover of George I in 1714, Tory Jacobites in England conspired to organise armed rebellions against the new Hanoverian government. They were indecisive and frightened by government arrests of their leaders. In Scotland 1715 is sometimes misleadingly called the First Jacobite Rebellion, which overlooks the fact that there had already been a major Jacobite rising in 1689, see above. The Treaty of Utrecht ended hostilities between France and Britain. From France, as part of widespread Jacobite plotting, James Stuart, the old pretender, had been corresponding with the Earl of Mar. In the summer of 1715 James called on Mar to raise the clans. 
Ma, nicknamed Bobbin, John, rushed from London to Bremer. He summoned clan leaders to a grand hunting match on 27 August 1715. On 6 September he proclaimed James as their lawful sovereign and raised the old Scottish standard. Mars' proclamation brought in an alliance of clans and northern lowlanders, and they quickly overran many parts of the highlands. Mars Jacobites captured Perth on 14 September without opposition. His army grew to around 8,000 men. A force of fewer than 2,000 men under the Duke of Argyle held the Stirling Plain for the government and May indecisively kept his forces in Perth. He waited for the Earl of Seaforth to arrive with a body of northern clans. Seaforth was delayed by attacks from other clans loyal to the government. Planned risings in Wales, Devon and Cornwall were forestalled by the government arresting the local Jacobites. See separate article on the Jacobite uprising in Cornwall of 1715 starting around 6 October. A rising in the north of England grew to about 300 horsemen under Thomas Forster, a Northumberland squire and MP. This English contingent contained some prominent people, including two peers of the realm, James Ratcliffe, 3rd Earl of Derwentwater and Lord Widrington, and a future peer, Charles Ratcliffe, later 5th Earl of Derwentwater. They joined forces with a rising in the south of Scotland under Viscount Kenmuir. Mar sent a Jacobite force under Brigadier William Mackintosh at Balham to join him. They left Perth on 10 October and were ferried across the Firth of Forth from Bunt Island to East Lothian. Here they were diverted into an attack on an undefended Edinburgh. But having seized Leith Citadel they were chased away by the arrival of Argyle's forces. Mackintosh's force of about 2,000 then made their way south and met their allies at Kelso in the Scottish borders on the 22nd of October, and spent a few days arguing over their options. The Scots wanted to fight government forces in the vicinity or attack Dumfries and Glasgow, but the English were determined to march towards Liverpool and led them to expect 20,000 recruits in Lancashire. The Highlanders resisted marching into England and there were some mutinies and defections, but they pressed on. Instead of the expected welcome the Jacobites were met by hostile militia armed with pitchforks and very few recruits. They were unopposed in Lancaster and found about 1,500 recruits as they reached Preston on 9 November, bringing their force to around 4,000. Then Hanoverian forces arrived to besiege them at the Battle of Preston. The Jacobites actually won the first day of the battle, killing large numbers of government forces. However, government reinforcements arrived, and the Jacobites surrendered on 14 November. In Scotland, at the Battle of Sheriffmuir on 13 November, Mars' forces were unable to defeat a smaller force led by the Duke of Argyll and Mar retreated to Perth while the government army built up. On the 22nd of December 1715 a ship from France finally brought the old pretender to Peterhead in person, but an ailing James proved far too timid and melancholy to inspire his followers. He briefly set up court at Scone, Perthshire, visited his troops in Perth and ordered the burning of villages to hinder the advance of the Duke of Argyll through deep snow. The Highlanders were cheered by the prospect of battle, but James's councillors decided to abandon the endeavour and ordered a retreat to the coast, giving the pretext of seeking a stronger position. James boarded a ship at Montrose and escaped to France on 4 February 1716, leaving a message assigning his Highland adherents to shift for themselves. Government garrisons were built or extended in the Great Glen at Fort William, Killyfeeman and Fort George, Inverness, as well as barracks at Ruthven, Burn Era and Inversnade, linked to the south by the Wade Roads constructed for Major General George Wade. On the whole, the government adopted a gentle approach and attempted to win hearts and minds by allowing the bulk of the defeated rebels to slip away back to 
their homes and committing the first £20,000 of revenue from forfeited estates to the establishment of Presbyterian-run Scots-speaking schools in the Highlands and Presbyterianism at the expense of Episcopalianism and Roman Catholicism, the rising of 1719 with France at peace with Britain and enjoying a rapprochement due to the Anglo-French alliance. The Jacobites found a new ally in Spain's minister to the king, Cardinal Giulio Alberoni. An invasion force set sail in 1719 with two frigates to land in Scotland to raise the clans. Twenty-seven ships carried 5,000 soldiers to England, but the latter were dispersed by storms before they could land. When the two Spanish frigates successfully landed a party of Jacobites led by Lord Tully Barden and Earl Mariscal with 300 Spanish soldiers at Loch, Dewick, they held Ellen Donan Castle but this was soon captured and destroyed by a Royal Naval Reconnaissance Force. They met only lukewarm support from a few clans. At the Battle of Glenshiel, the Spanish soldiers were forced to surrender to government forces. Further action by Wade. In 1725 Wade raised the independent companies of the Black Watch as a militia to keep peace in the unruly highlands, but in 1743 they were moved to fight the French in Flanders. Their commander at the Battle of Fontenoy in May 1745 was the Duke of Cumberland, soon to command at Culloden.